Welcome to Healthy Frontiers. My name is Dr. Bizzoni, and this show is dedicated to the education of our viewers. The topic tonight is physical medicine and rehabilitation. My special guest is Dr. Brad Cash. Dr. Cash has been practicing here in White Plains for almost five years. He's the owner of Spine Options and works hand in hand with many of the other uh, uh, medical practitioners in town. And so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Cash to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Cash, can you tell me a little bit about your background? and how you got into physiatry? Sure. I, I did grow up in New York, right. and I went to college at Emory University in Atlanta, right. and then I decided to come back to New York, and I attended medical school at New York Medical College here in Valhalla. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time, I had the tough task of choosing which specialty uh, to pursue, right. and at that point in time, I did decide that I did not want to be a surgeon, and I mm -hmm. actually wanted to help people avoid surgery. Okay. So I, I did choose the field of physical medicine and rehabilitation, right. which is no, which is known as physiatry, mm -hmm. uh, which is a specialty to study nerves and muscles and how they function together and and the overall function uh, of the body huh? of the body and patient and okay. and how we can help them avoid pains and improve their function after after injuries or after strokes or uh, surgeries, hip replacements, and so okay, forth. Okay, so physiatry. The, the term, the word physiatrist really entails more than just uh, working musculoskeletally, right, with the muscles and tendons and ligaments. I mean, if someone has a stroke, uh, that may affect their body, and that would, you guys can help them out as well. All right, that, that's yeah. correct, Dr. Bizzoni. Yeah. You know, there, there are many sub-areas of specialty mm -hmm. under, underneath the field of physiatry. Right. You know, there are those that specialize just in brain injury, mm -hmm. and some that specialize in spinal cord injury. Right. Those that specialize in multiple sclerosis, those that help people with amputations, and okay. those that help people after long hospitalizations. All right, so physiatry is not just come in, uh, get examined because I have back pain, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, which is a big part of many physiatrist practices, but it can uh, help with other more serious ailments as well, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. My, my area okay. especially is more related to the, to the neck and back. Right. But when I did do my residency training at Mount Sinai Hospital in, in Manhattan, yeah. uh, of course, we had to learn every, every area of the field right. and then decide which area to focus on. Right, and that's what you felt most comfortable with that, and you were drawn to that for the reasons you had just said, help that's people correct. avoid surgery. Right, that's correct. Okay, so what's your unique approach to the diagnosis and treatment of back pain? Let's talk about back pain since it's you know, 80% of the world will have it at some point in their life, right? So Absolutely. So it's a major uh, malady. So tell me uh, how you focus in on, on uh, back pain. Right, well... Back back pain, just in general, is probably the, the number one reason why why anyone goes to see their physician. Right. Uh, the second reason is is the common cold. Mm -hmm. So you know, there there are many many causes and reasons for back pain, right. and and neck pain for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and what what I try to do is try to help people figure out what exactly caused their pain, right. and and then try to help people treat their pain. Right. With the with the common goal in mind is of improving their 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 pain symptoms and improving their overall function. Right. You know while while avoiding surgery. Okay. Right. So I mean that comes you utilize medication when when necessary and or uh, other uh, types of uh, alternative care so to speak. Right. Altogether. Right. And my 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 approach to to evaluating a patient with with back and neck pain mm -hmm. is fairly comprehensive. You know, the yeah, take a step by step. Right. Go ahead. You know, tip, typically, you know, a patient comes into my office. They fill out a ten-page form, right. answering all all types of questions about, you know, when their pain started, where the location of the pain is, if their pain travels to their arms from their neck or mm -hmm. to their legs from from their back. They they you know need to determine if the pain is uh, worse in any certain positions, whether it be sitting. Or standing, or lying down, right. or if there's any activity mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, causes the pain, and you know, then after after the patient fills out this form, which they're usually not too happy about, right. but it, but it it does gives you a lot of information. It does give me a, a tremendous insight. Right. I take a, a very a very comprehensive his, you know history right. of of other episodes of back pain, and you know what causes the pain, what makes right. the pain go away. When the pain occurs, if there's a certain time of the day that the pain happens, if they if they tried any medications, if they a lot of people like to try putting heat on their back, some people try putting ice ice on their back. Right. 
you know, then yeah. some people try to lay in bed all day, you know, or for a week yeah. to, to try to make their pain go away. And everybody's trying these different things, and maybe someone has told them to try this, try that, and really you don't even have a reason or a cause to their problem until you totally evaluate it by a professional. Right, exactly. I, I mean, it's, I find that in my practice, years, years before patients have been in auto accidents or they've had a fall or a bike when they were 10 or 12, and that was the start of a major problem that doesn't surface until they're in middle age. You find that often yourself? Right, yeah. right, because, it, because it's the, slightest, the slightest mobility right. or, injur or injury to to the yeah. back or spine yeah. uh, might cause a millimeter of movement and right. then years later an, another small movement adds to the, to the first one until finally you have this whole you know myriad of, of, of symptoms and, and yeah. injuries that kind of all add up and cause intractable pain. Yeah, And the, the tissue just can break down and it, it's done slowly and it's not until the symptom occurs. Isn't that true that you know a lot of times uh, the patient will come to the office but there's been a lot of damage done Right. At that point, right. sometimes, so, sometimes, and without the history that you you do this comprehensive history, you would have even not even known about that. Right. Once in a while, you see someone that that fell when they were ten years old down a flight of steps. Right. And they might have been fine for years, and mm -hmm. and then have a recurrence of symptoms. Right. That they had twenty years prior. Right. And I know this is so important. This is such an important point for us, you know, as doctors, to be able to get that con comprehensive history, really and find out. I mean, it gives us so much direction, doesn't it? Then we know where to take the diagnosis. We know the patient may need x-ray if they may need an MRI, correct? Exactly. And, so, and, then, right, and then, I mean, the next step of the history is a little more detailed. You, you want to try to find out if the patient has any, any numbness right. or tingling in any, in any you know, portion of their, their arms or legs right. or, if, or if they have any, any weakness. So what would numbness or tingling, tingling tell the audience what that might indicate if they have, say they come into your office, doc, I have tingling in my fingers or I have tingling in my toes. What would that be uh, indicative of possibly? Right, very commonly when, there, when there's tingling, it means that some, some nerve is being pressed on somewhere, right. whether it be in the neck or somewhere in the arm or, or in the legs. Right. It usually means nerve compression. And it's my, it's my job to help figure out where that nerve is being compressed right. and, and what we can do about it. Right. For example, I mean, somebody can come with tingling in the fingers, right? And it could be something to do with a, a wrist problem. Maybe they've been on a computer a lot. Uh, and it's what we call carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Or it could be from the neck or there could be a combination, right? Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. When, you're, when you do have tingling in, in, the, in the hands or in the fingers, mm -hmm. it can mean a nerve compression. It could be somewhere in the neck. It could be in the shoulder region, it might right. be in the elbow region, right. or or in the wrist, yeah, and commonly known as carpal tunnel. Yeah, and it's not uncommon for you to have referred sensation or tingling from a distal point or a point maybe in the neck or the back of your feet, correct? Because a lot of people don't put those two together, that's why I'm trying to make that point. Yeah, that's correct, and, you know? and, and as, as a physician and through through our medical training, we also have to keep in keep in mind other other medical causes right. of nerve compression. Yeah. And, and very, t very typically, people people that are having heart disease and, and heart attacks complain of tingling down down the left arm, right. and it's often important to to as the first step to make sure that it's not a heart problem. Right, and even with a diabetic, for example, wouldn't that be true with a neuropathy in the leg or so? You know, the things there's so many different uh, symptoms that could mimic one another and mimic different conditions. So uh, that again, I go right back to that strong history and examination. So. You know, before we go any further on that, why don't we just, uh, since we're going to be talking about back pain in depth and when we might need an MRI or, or ha what have you and some, some types of treatment like injections, if that's necessary, or medication, if that's necessary, just point out to us in the spine, you know, what does the disc look like and uh, tell the audience what the, uh, the vertebrae look like and how that nerve can actually be compromised in the spinal level. So sure. Gen generally, uh, this is a stru the structure of, of a of a unit of the of the spine, right. and generally the the vertebrae or or our backbone gives us gives us the support to stand up. Right. Without, without the vertebrae, we would be like jelly, and mm -hmm. we'd be we'd be on on the floor. The vertebrae is all all solid bone, right. you know, in front and in in behind uh, the the bone behind the spinal cord itself is has all types of sharp pointy processes which which help protect the spinal cord. Correct. And also and the muscles all attached there, et cetera, right? Right, and there are also yep. several joints which which allows us to move. Right. If we were if it was a solid block throughout like it is in the front, we wouldn't be able to bend and twist and, and rotate. Mm -hmm. 
so it's necessary to have this, these, these joints and all these uh, small bones and processes to help, to help uh, the, the, uh, the mobility of the spine. Right. The, the spinal cord runs directly through, through the middle of the vertebral column, and mm -hmm. it's, it's all nerves. It comes down from the brain right. all the way down to the lower back. And it is protected uh, completely by the bones. Right. Then, the discs are the areas of substance between between the vertebrae, which they're they're soft jelly-like cushions. Uh, some people refer to them like a jelly donut. Uh, they have a, a a soft outside, and and inside there's a, a jelly-like material. Okay. And when the, when there are problems with the discs, sometimes they shrink in size and. They lose their their water substance and they, they dehydrate and sometimes this this jelly like material uh, comes out right. and and may touch may touch some of the nerves and cause severe pain. Right. Uh, the spinal cord that runs through the spine gives off sprouts of, of nerves or nerve roots uh, that form the nerves that go that go into the legs mm -hmm. and go into the arms. And typically, ner nerves are like electrical wires. Right. Uh, they have a an insulating covering on the outside, and there are fibers on the inside, mm -hmm. and they're really like the power supply to, to the muscles. Mm -hmm. Without the nerves, our, our, our muscles don't have the ability to move. Gotcha. Great. So sometimes these discs get, do get damaged, uh, and even in just in this model here, you can you see there's a little bit of arthritic spurring taking place, correct? And that would uh, uh, what would that signify right there? Tell the audience. Well, when you have when you have Damage to the disc and, mm -hmm. and arthritic spurring or bone or bone spurs yep. uh, from from chronic long-term disease. Uh, what what happens to the disc? They dehydrate and they and they degenerate. Mm -hmm. uh, and they they lose their their jelly-like material inside. Right. And and then and the bones actually get closer together. Right. You, know, you, you can compare the normal disc to the worn disc to yep. the worn-out disc mm -hmm. and. You know, you can see the space is a lot more narrow right. on the one out disc, uh, and nice. this this is what can explain why why people get sh why people get shorter in height. Huh? You know, you over time the di the discs actually lose their their jelly like material, right? And and they degenerate. Mm -hmm. Also, what you might see in in a disc is a is a disc herniation. Uh, in this di in this disc. Uh, the jelly-like material comes comes out the side, and, mm -hmm. and touches the nerve, mm -hmm. and this is this is one of the nerves that goes down the leg, right. and in this type of situation, the the person might feel pain going all the way down the leg, right. in the same area that the nerve travels. Great, okay, and it's, isn't it true that you, a person may have this gel-like substance coming out? And it may be a herniated disc, and they may show some signs of it, but we're really not sure that they have that until we have an MRI or a CAT scan, correct? So right. when, when do you uh, uh, decide that a person needs MRI testing as a physiatrist? Right, well, in, in the process of trying to figure out uh, where the pain might be coming from, right. after the physical, after the history, I conduct a comprehensive physical exam. Right. And in this physical exam, the things that are important to me that, that I look for are, are weakness in any one muscle area, right. numbness or tingling mm -hmm. in in any one zone of the arm or leg, right. and changes in in the in the in the reflexes. Okay. And with the combination of these three things, it helps me it helps me direct towards any certain nerve right. or nerve root that might be damaged. Mm -hmm. And when I do see these types of of symptoms, right. You know, we're fortunate we have the technology these days to, to have an MRI right. you know, to look at these things. And MRIs are certainly better than, than CAT scans mm -hmm. uh, in, viewing, in viewing the discs and the soft tissues right. and, and the nerves. Okay. Uh, and they, they do help us you know, directly visualize right. if there's a disc out of place. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to do a CAT scan right. in, those pa in those patients with pacemakers or, or metal implants. Right. When, it, when, it, when an MRI could be done. We'll do the appropriate test. Then also in your office, I know you do a lot of electrodiagnostic testing, EMGs, et cetera. Why don't you explain to the audience a little bit about that? Uh, I know that they hear terms like EMG and NCV and uh, diagnostic testing electrically. What is that? Sure. Well, 
by, by history, mm -hmm. and if you look at mul multiple websites about about EMGs, EMG is a, one of the most feared tests right. uh, by patients. Mm -hmm. Again, fortunately, with technology, the, the the tests have become easier to conduct. The equipment has become more sensitive, and the tests have been more more tolerable to okay. patients. What what an EMG is? It stands for uh, electromyography, right? And NCV stands for nerve conduction velocity or nerve conduction studies. Okay. And and what it, what it is is a it's a test of the function of the of the nerves. Right. If you're doing the the back and the legs, it's it's a test of the function of the nerves from the back all the way down to the toes, mm -hmm. and in the upper part of the body from the neck all the way to the fingertips. Right. And you know we might want to do a test like this if we suspect any type of nerve damage mm -hmm. from any type of compression of at the spinal area, possibly, of, right? Of any nerve, yeah. you know, for any of the mm -hmm. symptoms that we that we were talking about. Okay. Um, and it's it's a really useful test mm -hmm. to complement doing an MRI or a good physical exam right. because an MRI just merely shows the the structure of of the spine or whatever body part we mm -hmm. you know we we're taking, but it doesn't. It can't tell you if there's any if there's any damage. It can just tell you how things look. Right. And the electrodiagnostic testing allow, allows us to to actually test the nerves and the nerve roots right. to see if there's any damage. Right. So you get a more complete evaluation on that. Right. And yeah. the test is really divided up in, into two parts. Mm -hmm. The the first part are nerve conduction studies. Right. Where we we simulate nerve nerve activity by using an electrical probe. Right. And and giving the patient a, a very low dose electrical mm -hmm. shock, mm -hmm. uh, and we record the activity mm -hmm. with with various electrodes, and we get a, a tracing on, on a computer screen. Th that's the first part of the test. Right. And the, the second part of the test is using a very a very fine needle, almost the size of an acupuncture pin, okay. and we we put it in in certain muscles, and we record the muscle activity. Right. There's also a tracing that appears on on the computer screen and as well there's there's a sound that comes out of the amplifier right. and there are normal and abnormal sounds that that are associated you know with this, with this activity right so the test becomes very very useful right to complement or add to an MRI to determine if there's any kind of nerve damage perfect so then you know where to go with that and I know you also recommend medications in your office for acute pain, some medications for chronic pain. Just give me a little overview there, because you guys seem to have, you know, you can have your, to be able to do it all. I mean, you can do some medication if you need it, or you have other modalities that we'll talk about in a moment. But tell me about the medications right. for acute well, pain. Right. If a patient comes in and they have a new back pain, right. you know, from lifting a heavy object or you know, moving their refrigerator or right. lifting their child out of the crib, Mm -hmm. Or changing the tire on the car, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. and typically those patients come in, you know, crawling into the office, and their their backs in an acute spasm. Right. All the all the muscles are, are cramped up, mm -hmm. and they they usually do not have pain going down the legs, but some, but sometimes they sometimes they do. Right. But what we what we try to do to help them with their acute pain uh, are three different types of things. One, we like to give anti anti-inflammatory medications mm -hmm. to reduce some of the inflammation that might have that might have occurred you know, dur during an injury mm -hmm. uh, that, has, that has torn some muscle fibers, you know, if it was a severe strain mm -hmm. or, even, or even, a, even a disc uh, slippage or right. herniation, the nerves and muscles tend to get inflamed. So we like to use an anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. on, a, on a scheduled, regular basis, right. you know, usually three times a day for a week or 10 days. Okay. Uh, we also like to use muscle relaxers mm -hmm. uh, to help reduce some of the, some of the spasms that are occurring, you know, in, the, in, in all the muscles, you know, surrounding the, the right. spine. Uh, the muscle relaxers also also help patients sleep, so right. it allows them to be in a more comfortable position. Right. And then some, sometimes for patients in severe agonizing pain, mm -hmm. we use we use some some stronger uh, control substances or na narcotic style medications, okay. uh, just to ju just to really help them you know, get some rest and be a, little, heal. be a little more comfortable. Okay. Great. And sometimes you use injections. I mean, if say, when is that appropriate? Tell, tell the audience, when the, that would be appropriate to use injections uh, for pain. And there are different types of injections. Maybe can you just give us a little overview of, you know, what's appropriate when. Right. For, for, for a patient with, a, with acute pain, 
right. you know, if they're coming into coming into the office, mm -hmm. you know, usually within the first week or so, that when they have a, you know severe pain and spasm, right. with no with no symptoms, going down the legs or going down the arms, right. usually we're not suspecting you know a pinched nerve or or mm -hmm. a slipped disc yes. in the neck or back. If if we're just if we're just seeing severe muscle spasm, frequently we'll give a, a very local injection in the office, you know, very safe, not right. near the spine. No anesthetic needed. Or any, or any, right, or no anesthesia needed, right. no no TV or fluoroscopy guidance is needed. Mm -hmm. uh, these injections usually just in the, in the soft tissue and the muscles right. surrounding the spine. We usually give a, you know, a, some type of steroid and some type of local, anest local anesthetic, almost like a Novocaine. When you, so it's a little you know, deep, but that, that tight. Right, yeah. and into the muscles to help reduce a lot of the pain and spasm. Okay. You know, that, that's, that's certainly the, mo the most simple right. type of, in, of injection. Right. When, when a patient has more long-standing pain and the simple medications and anti-inflammatories are, are not helpful, you know, they, those people need more, more aggressive injections. Right. And you know, people, always, people always talk about epidural injections. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's probably the, mo the most common type. And typically, typically what those are, those are injections that have that sh have to and should be done under specific guidance, you know, on, on a on a TV screen, right. where a camera a camera is put in. It's, it's called fluoroscopy, mm -hmm. and those need to be done in the appropriate setting for right. safety. So that can't be done in an office setting. It's more done in a surgical application kind of setting. Right. Some offices do have what you know yeah. what's called a C arm, right. uh, which is the the equipment that's necessary to you know to do these type of injections. Right. And you know what what they do is. You know, they they use a TV guidance and they they localize the area where where the doctor thinks the, the pain is coming from and the ner and the specific nerve, and they they take a needle with with uh, some type of steroid or cortisone and they inject right you know right next to the, to the nerve tissue mm -hmm. or by the spine to to really help really localize the site of inflammation and swelling, uh, and, and they put the steroid in. I think most people are so afraid that they're going to hit the nerve, and that's so. That's why it's so important to do it under fluoroscopy, right? So, I mean, when you're going that deep, right? There, you know. there, there are certainly possible compl complications right. with the procedure, right? And you know, fortunately, I haven't seen it in a few years, but I have seen in the past. Right. There, there's always a possibility of, of hitting the nerve and causing nerve damage. There's right. also a possibility of causing an infection right. in the area where where mm -hmm. people possibly need surgery. There's possible. Right. It's possible to hit a blood vessel. So there are vessel. some downsides. So you try to avoid it at the deeper stuff if you can. Right. But, yeah. you know, with a properly trained person with a proper, t proper technique, right. the complications are, are very, very, very rare. Okay, great. So if you want a patient to avoid surgery, you go through these uh, recommendations first. You know, you obviously go through the injections. You have given a medication. And what other procedures might you employ um, in your office? Uh, to help someone avoid surgery if they're having, say, chronic back pain that's really not uh, being relieved with medication and or injection? Right, well, cer certainly medications and injections aren't always the answer. Sometimes right. they're, just, they're, right. they're just putting the Band-Aid over the problem. Correct. And what, what patients really need to do is, especially if they have a pinched nerve, is, is they, need, they need to mobilize the area and relieve that, relieve that pressure. Right, it's a mechanical on, problem, on so you have to change it. Right. Yeah. And that's and that's typically done with different, sometimes different traction type machines mm -hmm. uh, can relieve pressure on the area and help help the disc go back into place. Right. And with different types of physical therapy and, and chiropractics, mm -hmm. especially, mm -hmm. there are different manual or manipulative techniques right. that help relieve the pressure on the nerve. Yes. And, and 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 unfortunately, it doesn't happen just with with one visit. Right. You know, you know, typically patients get treated. You know, two to five times a week. Right. You know, with these manual techniques mm -hmm. to relieve the pressure and, and and help maintain it. Sure. It's not gonna. It, it may have taken a while to get to that point, so it's going to take some time to. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. It's like it's not like a pill or a magic bullet. That you know, it's going right. to take some time, and they have to participate. Isn't that true? Right. And, that, and not, exercises need to do it. Right. And not only that, and as I as I tell all my patients, if you go to a physical therapist or a chiropractor or an acupuncturist right. or a massage therapist, yes, three times a week for a half hour. Right. That's that's 90 minutes of your week. There are 168 hours in a week. There you go. So those people also need to to go home with their homework and right. do the proper stretching techniques and sure. strengthening techniques 
and also not do things that that might aggravate you know, aggravate and help, sure. you know prevent their their healing right and you know usually it's not the there's usually not one technique that say mm -hmm. this technique is the one that's going to make you better sometimes it's a, it's the right formula and the right. right medication the right injection and everybody's know, different the right type of technique and you know right. it's the combination of treatments that frequently sure. works faster and more right. effectively sure. than than just one one particular treatment. Right. And you're right, and everyone's different. And for, for those with multiple episodes of the same type of pain over the years, mm -hmm. those patients are usually educated enough to know that their acupuncturist or their massage therapist or their chiropractor or physical therapist is the one that helps the most because right. because they've they've had the most experience. Right. But for the for the new episode or most naive patient you have, to, you have to help them figure out. It certainly makes my job easier right. when a patient comes in and knows which technique is the best for them. Sure, you can direct them, and that's what your job in, in your in your spine options is to just direct them to the right place and uh, get the job done. Right. I, I see I see people with neck and back pain yeah. all day. Right. And it's it's like figuring out the pieces of the, of the puzzle. Sure. Figure out exactly where the pain is coming from, and, yeah. and and direct them toward towards the right specialty. Right. And the right modality. To help them alleviate their pain. That's great. Any final thoughts for the audience on uh, back pain or neck pain, uh, in diagnostic mode or in treatment mode? Sure. I mean, kind of un un not unrelated, but cer and certainly very related uh, mm -hmm. to what we were talking about. Um, weight and body mechanics and posture so are, important. are probably the, the three most important issues. To address early, early on, especially as as we age, when we, you know, when we're when we're teenagers, you know, we can typically eat whatever we want and never, yes. and never gain weight. And as we age, mm -hmm. you know, when we start going into the second and third decade of life, right. we need to, you know, really watch our weight and and our body posture and keep and keep the midsection of our body very strong. With strong abdominals and 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 posture, we're, we're able to maintain ourselves and preventing preventing back pain. It's great advice, Doc. Dr. Cash, I want to thank you for being on the show. It was wonderful. Thank you very I think much. The audience I'm got good. a lot of great information. If you have any questions for myself or for Dr. Brad Cash, uh, you can look at our websites and email any questions, and we'll get the answers to you just as soon as we can. I thank you for being on the show, and we look forward to seeing you again.